1 Thessalonians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> writing to the church at Thessalonica. He's writing to them, encouraging them, and uh, having them to uh, grow stronger and stronger. He, he commends them in chapter 2 and verse 13 because when they heard the gospel, they received it not as the words of men, but as the word of God. And he commends them for their, their strength and their endurance. And in chapter 3, he's going to talk more about that. As we said before, the theme of First and Second Thessalonians is the second coming of Christ. In every chapter, you see... Paul discussing the coming of Christ in chapter 4. He's going to talk about it in an extended period. He's going to talk about it more than he does in the rest of the chapters. But he says, if you look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17, he says, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. So Paul and those who accompanied him had been taken away from the Thessalonian brethren. You remember in Acts 17 the, the trouble that stirred up by those false teachers that Paul and his companions had to leave. But he wants to see them. He said, we're taken away in presence but not in heart. See, you see the, the tenderness there of Paul, how he, he cared so much about the Thessalonian brethren. And he says he has a great desire to see them, verse 18. Therefore, we want to come to you, even I, Paul, time and time again. But Satan hindered us. There were times that Paul wanted to go see them, but was hindered by Satan. The, the devil working through uh, his uh, people on earth to hinder the cause of Christ. were hindering his, uh, his work. Uh, verse 19. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown, our rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and His coming? So Paul here is uh, talking about what is causing him to rejoice and what is his hope and his crown and his joy. And he thinks back on the conversion of the Thessalonians and how if they remain faithful, they will be present in the presence of of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. And that presence is a favorable presence. Now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul is going to talk about those when Jesus returns who are going to be banished from God's presence. Those who know not God and those who obey not the gospel will be banished from God's presence in everlasting destruction. But those who are faithful will be present with the Lord at His coming in a favorable way, and they will always be with the Lord. In verse 20, he says, For you are our glory and joy. When, when Paul thought back on the Thessalonian brethren, it, it just made his heart rejoice. Because of their reception of the gospel and their continuing in the things of God. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. Therefore, when we could no, uh, could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. Verse 2. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborers, laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. So Timothy was sent to Thessalonica, on a uh, mission there to help them out. He's described here as a minister of God, fellow laborer of uh, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he was sent there to help out the Thessalonian congregation to establish them and encourage them concerning their faith. So Timothy was sent there for a while as a preacher to help them and encourage them. Paul later on would write to Timothy, we have them in our New Testament as the books of First and Second Timothy. So this was a, uh, a young man that was working with Paul to spread the gospel of Christ throughout the ancient world. 
Verse 3, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Talking about the afflictions or the, the trouble that they are facing being Christians. The trouble that they face in, in, in coming out of the religions of men to become a member of the Lord's church. Remember in chapter 1 how he talked about they, they gave up worshiping idols to serve the living and true God. And so when you do that, there's going to be family members and, and friends in, in their society that's going to look down upon them and give them a hard time for doing that. So they endure that inflict, uh, affliction, plus some of the false teachers that were going around following the Apostle Paul and stirring up trouble for him from town to town. And so that affliction there, the word affliction there uh, means to to be pressed down upon. The affliction there refers to how Satan, if he cannot use temptations or the allurements of the world to cause the children of God to become unfaithful, he'll use hardship. He'll use persecution. He'll use uh, what's called here uh, afflictions. To try to discourage the child of God and have them throw in the towel. So, right. And in First Corinthians, I believe you're, uh, you're referring to that. Maybe it's Second Corinthians. But all through all through the New Testament, there is that uh, that the problem of uh, affliction, the problem of persecution that they were facing, and he's saying. Here, we don't want you to be shaken. We don't want you to be uh, disturbed here uh, as someone who is allowing the, the problems of life to cause you to, to turn away from the Lord. So that, I mean, that's, when you look at the New Testament, you look at the Bible, that's how the, the devil works. The devil could not get at Job through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. He couldn't get it that way, so he threw affliction and problems towards Job of the Old Testament. And really, he didn't get him that way either. He remained uh, steadfast, and he got very, very discouraged. And uh, when you read the book of Job, you read that. But it, it's, it's either one way or the other that the, the devil will, will use those things to, to cause people to either be tempted to leave are so discouraged that they will leave. And if we're not careful, brethren, it will happen to us. Through affliction, through persecution, you know, if the devil can't use any of the, uh, the, the allurements of temptation, he'll use us uh, or use things to wear us down to the point where we just give up. I don't want to do it anymore. Then he's got you. Either way, the devil wins when we give in to that. And he says in verse 3, he says, No one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. This is something that was uh, told by Christ in Matthew chapter 5. Persecution is going to come. It's going to happen. Verse 4, For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we should suffer tribulation just as it happened and you know. So he says, when we were with you, we told you this was going to happen. You're going to suffer tribulation in the world. This is a part of uh, being a Christian. Verse 5, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. Who's the tempter? The devil. Satan. So the tempter, he, he, he says, when I could not uh, no longer endure it, endure it, I sent to know your faith. Well, how could, how could Paul know it except he sent send someone to them? You know, they didn't have the internet. He couldn't send an email. He couldn't call them on the telephone. He couldn't get a cell phone and call them. So he sent Timothy to see how they were doing. Well, Timothy returns for 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news, 
how that must have encouraged Paul. Remember, he said in verse 5, he didn't want his labor to be in vain. He didn't want the devil to, to, to go in into that congregation and through any means necessary, uh, whether it be through affliction or through any other way, and, and destroy the work that they had done there in Thessalonica. And he said, I, don't, I didn't want to labor in vain. He said, I got the good news from Timothy when he came back. Uh, he says in verse 6, Of your faith and love, and that you always have a good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. So Timothy goes, he encourages them, probably preaches for them for a while. We're not told how long this, this took place. But then Timothy returns to Paul and says, I've got some good news. The church in Thessalonica is still strong. Despite the afflictions, despite what the devil is throwing at them, they're hanging in there. They're remaining strong. And that they have a good remembrance of us, and they desire to see us just as much as we desire to see them. So that must have made Paul feel so much better to know that they were remaining faithful. Verse 7, Therefore, brethren, in all our afflictions and distresses, we were con comforted concerning you by your faith. So w what Paul and Timothy were enduring, as far as their afflictions, when, when Timothy came back and gave that good news to Paul that the Thessalonian brethren are remaining faithful, that encouraged Paul and Timothy. Even though they were going through affliction and distress, uh, they were comforted knowing that the brethren in Thessalonica, they are remaining faithful. Verse 8, For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. That word, or those two words, stand fast, is uh, taken from the Greek, and it's a Greek expression that means an army that is set to battle and is not going to retreat. That's what it means. Stand fast. This army is going into battle and they're not going to retreat from the enemy. And he is basically saying this is what we've got to have as Christians. This, this attitude of there's no, no retreat. That's not an option. And if we have that attitude as individual Christians... When we have that attitude collectively as the church, the devil is not going to get a foothold with us. He's not going to do it. He won't do it in our individual lives, and he will not do it here as a congregation. If we have this stand fast attitude, this uh, attitude of we're not going to retreat, we're not going to back down, we're going to continue the fight in the face of affliction, in the face of whatever the devil may throw at us. Verse 9. But what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which uh, which we re rejoice for your sake before our God? So he's, he's saying we, we give thanks to God, the joy that you bring us. Verse 10, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So he wants to see them. He wants to help them to mature, to perfect to go on to perfection. And that, that, that term doesn't mean sinlessness. It means a maturity. He wants to help them to mature, to, to reach a state of maturity in their faith. So they were basically a, a, a fledgling or newborn babes in Christ when Paul had to leave them due to persecution. And so he had to go someplace else and leave them there as babes in Christ but yet, as babes in Christ, they still remain steadfast. They still remain faithful, and they did not uh, give up their faith. And that made Paul and Timothy rejoice. Because so oftentimes, people who are newborn babes in Christ, they, they are just fresh from the waters of baptism. When affliction and hard times come upon them, they'll fall away. And 
Paul was rejoicing to know that they were remaining steadfast uh, in their faith and, and enduring what they were facing. Verse 11. Now may our God, now here you begin a, a prayer that Paul is praying. Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct your way, uh, our way to you. Verse 12. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So he's praying that our way is directed to you so we can get to see you again. That you will increase and abound in love to one another. He's praying that love will abound in the congregation there. Verse 13, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. There again is mentioned the second coming of Christ. As said before, this is the the theme of First Thessalonians. He's talking about this the second coming of Christ. He'll repeat it over and over and over again. So he's praying that that they will get to see them again. He's praying that their love will abound in the congregation as they have love for them as well, and that they will be established in their hearts blameless in holiness, blameless before the Lord, in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. So you have here uh, the, the, the attitude or the, the, the admonition, I should say, verse 13, of being blameless in holiness. That is only accomplished when a person is justified in Christ. Look at Romans uh, chapter 8. Even though all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, we've all chosen to sin, violate the will of God. When we become Christians and we were, when we uh, live the Christian life, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. As a Christian, a person who is living according to the will of God, John says in 1 John chapter 1, you're walking in the light, confessing your sins with an attitude of repentance, then you're blameless. You're, you're justified. You're blameless in holiness, as uh, chapter 3 and verse 13 says in 1 Thessalonians. And that's the only way that we can be presented before the Father, in, in a state or a condition in which we can go to heaven. That's only in Christ. That's only in Christ. So, so understanding what God has done in providing salvation for us, that only that which is perfect can be in heaven with God for all eternity. Well, when we sin, we're no longer perfect. We are contaminated. We've fallen short of the glory of God. Well, salvation has been provided through His Son, Jesus Christ, in which we can once again regain blamelessness. That's justification. And as long as we maintain living this Christian life and following living that law of the Spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, walking according to His commandments and doing His will, with a constant attitude of repentance, a constant attitude of striving to do the will of the Lord, we're blameless. We're, we're blameless. And that's an amazing thing. That's justification. That's, that's total forgiveness. Now, when a person stops doing that, they stop walking in the light. They stop walking in harmony with the will of God. They're no longer blameless. And they have stepped outside of the grace of God. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4 says you can fall from grace. Or literally, the Greek means you can fall out of grace if you step outside 
uh, the will of God and start living in the flesh. <clears throat> so being blameless in holiness before uh, our, our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is something that can only be maintained in Christ. We're baptized into Christ, Galatians 3 and verse 27. From that point on, we have this relationship as we continue to walk in the light. Any questions or comments about that? that that's the amazing thing that some, some Christians, I don't think, fully either grasp or appreciate that when we are forgiven, we're blameless before the Lord. The problem is we have a hard time forgiving ourselves of what we've done. The blood of Christ, exactly, is what makes the difference. Without that shed blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And when a person is baptized into Christ, they sincerely repent, and they're baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, and they walk the Christian walk, and they're, they're, they're striving to do what is right, they are blameless. Now, I'm not talking about once saved, always saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. But I'm talking about if we're living the Christian life, we, we sometimes carry around guilt on our shoulders that we need to let go of. And it's guilt from, from things of our past that, that weigh us down, and we've got to understand that if we're in Christ and we're doing His will, then, then we're blameless in, in holiness. Now, we have to live in holiness. So, that, that's something that I, that I wish that Christians uh, can, can fully appreciate because so many Christians doubt their salvation and doubt whether they're in a right relationship with God almost on a daily basis. And I don't think God wants us to live that way. I believe we can know that we're in a right relationship with God, and I believe that we can know that, that we're walking in the light, and if we walk in the light, then we have the constant cleansing of the blood of Christ. And the only thing that can stop that is stop repenting, and stop confessing, and start sinning, and not, not walking in the light anymore. So it's, it's, it's this uh, assurance, this blessed assurance. We often times sing the song, Blessed Assurance, but do we really have it? Blessed Assurance. And of course, if you are guilty of something that you haven't repented of, this assurance isn't yours. It's only for those who are, are trying to walk in the light. Look at chapter 4 and verse 1. <clears throat> Chapter 4, especially when we get into the latter part of the verses, is really getting to the heart of the reason why Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. Uh, oftentimes, epistles in the New Testament, letters in the New Testament, were written by Paul or someone else to address a problem in a congregation or to answer a question that is in a congregation or a concern that's in a congregation. You have that uh, in chapter 4. He says in chapter 4 and verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should uh, abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. See, you, how you ought to walk. That's the word for live. Live your life. You ought to walk in a certain way. Remember, he said earlier in the book that we're to walk worthy of the gospel. Walk worthy. So there is a certain path, a certain direction that God wants us to walk. And he says, I want you to abound more and more in this. This is the growing that we should be doing as Christians. Verse 2. For you know that commandment, uh, that for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. Some translations may say fornication. So here you have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, you, you know the commandments that we gave you. They're commandments to obey. 
And so he, he's reminding them of that. And he says in verse 3, he says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. That word sanctification is a word that simply means to be set apart. To be set apart for the will of God. And this is God's will for you, that you be set apart for His will. You set apart your life when a person, as we said before, is baptized into Christ. They're saying, I'm being set apart for your will, O God. And specifically, he's dealing with something that may have been a problem at Thessalonica. Is that you should abstain from sexual immorality or fornication. Verse 4. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 5. Not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So he's talking about here uh, not being involved in sexual immorality. Now, sexual immorality is a, a broad term. And this term uh, refers to any kind of sexual activity that's illegal in the eyes of God. Whether it be looking at pornography on the Internet whether it be buying pornographic magazines, whether it be involving yourself uh, with someone who is not your spouse intimately, whether it be uh, involving someone, uh, two single people, involving themselves in activities that only are for a married couple within the covenant of marriage. And he is saying here that each of you should know how to possess your own vessel. Now, there have been several um, <clears throat> interpretations of, of what the vessel is. Some have uh, interpreted the vessel there as referring to the wife. I, I don't think that's talking about the wife there. I think he's talking about the body, the physical body. That he is saying here that you know how to possess your own physical body in sanctification and honor. Set aside... For the purposes of God, you have your body in control. He's basically talking about self-control. Verse 5. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. The people of the world, they're not concerned with self-control. I mean, it's, it's not on their agenda. I mean, you hear it in, in the music, the musical lyrics about losing control, they want to lose control. Uh, the concept is, in, in our society, uh, a man meets a girl, the, 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 the man and the woman, if they're dating, they're intimate with one another. I mean, that's just what is norm in our society. And that's illegal in the eyes of God. That is fornication. That is sexual immorality. And so... The world is not concerned about self-control. They're not, they're not concerned about that at all. And he says, you don't act like the world in the passion of lust like the Gentiles. They don't know God. Verse 6. That no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. So there might have been a situation there at Thessalonica in which a, a, a man might have been interested in an unscriptural way in another man's wife. Don't defraud his brother or your brother in this matter. Coveting or lusting after another man's wife. He said, don't, don't be involved in this. He said, you should not take advantage of or defraud uh, your brother in this in this situation. Uh, fornication or sexual immorality has been a problem in the church from well the first century until this day and age. You you find it in the, in the Lord's church, unfortunately, in time, and you probably all have heard of stories or places uh, where preachers have involved themselves illicitly with with people. Where I used to preach in Cleveland. There was a congregation called the West Side Church of Christ, and after I left there, I left the North England Street congregation I was preaching for, I heard a few years later, the preacher there at West Side had an affair with the secretary. He was a married man, she was a married woman, 
had an affair with her, brought reproach upon the church, did so much damage. I mean, that story can unfortunately be multiplied in different areas of the world. I've heard of missionaries going over to other places, other countries, and get uh, involved with some of the people there in sexual ways that are unscriptural. It's just something that the, the devil will use if a person is not willing to use self-control. And that's exactly what he's talking about. You have self-control. You possess your body in sanctification and honor. And it, it starts with the flirting. Husbands, you should not be flirting with anyone but your wife. Ever. Same way with wives. You shouldn't be flirting with anyone except your husband. And that's how it starts. With a little bit of what's called innocent flirting. The little things that are said back and forth. And then one thing leads to another and then it turns into sexual immorality. Your focus of your desire, husbands and wives, should be to your spouse and to them alone. That's what the Bible is talking about. And those who are single, those who are have not yet married, self-control. Self-control. You contain your body. You control this vessel with sanctification and honor. Look at verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Now, holiness is a word that's very similar to sanctification. In fact, a lot of times in the Greek, it's the same word. Sanctification and holiness are, are the same uh, words in the, in the original language. And that simply means to be set apart, once again, for the purposes of God and, and not to be of the world. We are not of the world. We've been called out of the world. We are the church. That Greek word means ekklesia. And it means a called out assembly that belongs to the Lord. So we belong to the Lord and so we should not be partaking of and involving ourselves in things of the world. We are of God. The people of God. Verse 8. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man but God, who has also given us His Holy Spirit. So the Apostle Paul is saying, if you reject this message, you're not rejecting the words of men. You're rejecting the words of God because he was writing by inspiration. He's saying, He has given us His Holy Spirit. Now the Apostles, they had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's why they could write with authority the will of God because the Holy Spirit was directing them. So he's telling them, if you reject this, you're not rejecting men's opinions or the, the, the words of men. You're rejecting God. Look at verse 9. But now, uh, concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so towards all the brethren who are all in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So he's, he's writing to them a concerning love. He says, we don't really need to write this to you because uh, you're taught this by God. You know to love one another. When, when, the, when a person understands the gospel message and understands God's love for us, what naturally follows is an understanding that we should love the people of the world to spread the gospel to them and to help them understand the love of God and the grace of God. He said in verse 10, Indeed, uh, you do so towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. So in that region where Thessalonica was, he says, you, your faith has gone out. He said that in chapter 1. Your reputation of your faith has gone out into that region, and your love has gone out into that region. And he says in verse 10, Also, but we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Love is something that we can all grow in. Can we really say that we love 
too much? Biblically speaking? It's something we're always striving to do more and more. Loving one another. We can always increase in that. And that's what Paul is saying here in verse 10. Increase more. Yes, you're, you're doing good with the loving, but you can increase more and more in love. Verse 11. That you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. So you live this life that's not the life of someone who's in everyone else's business. You love one another. You work with your own hands. You'll be a worker as we commanded you. He says in verse 12, that you may walk properly or live your life properly towards those who are outside. Who are those who are outside? What does that refer to? Unbelievers. The Gentiles. The people of the world. That you walk properly towards those who are outside. You're living your Christian life and people on the outside of the church, the Lord's church, are watching you. That you uh, may lack nothing. Now notice he said there that you are to work. He says, uh, work with your own hands. You be a worker. And uh, do the things that are pleasing in the eyes of the Lord by working. You know, people talk about welfare reform and the problem with uh, uh, welfare and things. I have a solution to it. It's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Here's what Paul said to the Thessalonians in his second letter. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, For even when we were with you, we commanded you this, If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. There is a solution. And you know, if we have a benevolent program within the congregation and have people who come to us for food and need work, uh, Perhaps we should have a sign or something on the, on the door of the pantry that has this verse on it. Not that we're not going to help those who are in need. We're going to help those, help those who are in immediate need. Especially if they have children, small children that can't help them. But are we to encourage laziness? If a person doesn't work, refuses to work. I'm not talking about a person who's who's trying to get a job and can't find one. They're having they're struggling in that area right now. I'm talking about a lazy person who does not work. Paul says they shouldn't be eating. Well I don't know if there's a scripture that words has those exact words in it, but I think the concept is in the Bible, you know. in Acts chapter two Peter said to the, the people there, save yourself from this crooked generation, this wicked generation. So there's a, there's a sense in which, you know, God offers salvation and we have to take it. You know, we have to make that action towards taking the salvation, the offer of salvation. But as far as, as helping those who are in need, we should uh, be really willing to help those who are willing to, to work and to... Uh, to do what is right. And some people are are prof professional, lazy people. Uh, they're professionally lazy. And there was an, uh, a program not long ago that, uh, that talked about people on the streets and the thousands of dollars they make on the street corner at intersections just asking for money. They make more than I do. A whole lot more than I do. Just standing there on the street corner asking for money. And they're, they're not willing to work. They don't want to work. They're making a whole lot more money not working. Begging. Now, of course, you fall into the situation where, as I said before, you have, you have children that are in a family that are in need. I, I believe that if, the, if, if our government would adopt the attitude of 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10, if there's small children involved with parents who are deadbeat, who will not work, they should be taken away from them. And, and 
Those children should be taken care of. But giving people free handouts promotes laziness. It promotes it. And Paul is saying here, you are to work with your own hands as we commanded you. You are to be working. You are to take care of yourself, your family, and those who are in need. And he says you are to walk properly towards those who are outside. We didn't get a chance to look at the latter part of uh, chapter 4, but we will take up with uh, verse 13 next week, Lord willing.